attend the independent as a nation on 31st of August 1957. Because of that, we Sarokian and Sabahan should thank our current Prime Minister Najib Tun Razak not only for his courage in writing right, the wrong, but for his perception, his understanding, and most important of all, his intelligence in, in reading the unhappiness of the two Borneo state of the Straits. When Malaysia Independence Day was celebrated to coincide with Malaysia with Malaya's independence. His courage, his understanding, and strong political will to trade where all the four predecessors did not touch. Najib Tun Razak, I think, is the president, is the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Because he agrees that nobody dared to do it before. But, but to right the wrong should not just stop at the Prime Minister's level. It should be observed by all Malaysia, regardless to region, regardless to state, regardless to your social strata. Although 16 September has appeared on our radar as Malaysia Day, as Malaysian Day, the 31st of August remained Independence Day celebrated at national level. As a result, Sarawakian and Sabahan, who are now in the 50s, are still questioning the significance of coining 31st of August as Malaysian Day of Independence, and, it's, and it is celebrated at national level. To the majority of Sarawak population at this age group, honoring the date of the 22nd July would have been more, more meaning and there will be more meaning more meaning to them that the 22nd of July is independent for Sarawak. Once again, the independent day of the two Borneo states is overshadowed by the independent days of the 11 Federated Malay State, which is the 31st of August. While the, old gener or while the older generation find the celebration on 31st August insignificant, Sarawakian and Sabahan, born after 1963, has mistaken 31st August as the real death of Malaysia Independent Day of a nation. The 47 years of celebration and reaccession has left a deep seated message in the minds of the young Sarawakian and Sabahan. Come 31st August, it's a national day for them. Songs were even created by singers and composers revealing that they believe were the correct facts about Malaysia Independence Day at 31st of August. Take Mardeka song by the late Sodi Mantos. So my kids are very keen. Every morning I hear to sing it with Mark. Tanggal 31, bulan 8, 57. Merdeka, merdeka, tetaplah merdeka, lah pasti menjadi sejarah. Every morning when I breakfast with my kid who is now 14 and 17, this is what they say. Tanggal 31, bulan 8, 57. 31st of August 1957, Merdeka, Merdeka. And it's only fixed up in their mind. So ask them, why do you sing it? It took the Merdeka day, 31st of December, uh, August. I said, no, it's 16. Okay, they accused me, you are wrong. So I just, so I just keep quiet, I don't talk around with my kids so early in the morning. Ladies <laughs> so, and gentlemen, this song is so well known across the nation and believed to be factual. Up until today, Nobody has ever questioned the validity of that fact until a few of us, and hopefully, and Muhammad and Darali King may question the letter. But nobody questioned 31st of August um, as an independent day for Malaysia. However, historical facts unravel. The young people of Pramsau and Sabah become suspicious and disturbed by the twisting of historical facts. Questions begin to emerge in their minds regarding the correct depth of Malaysia independence. One question they ask is, was it a genuine mistake? The second one, and most serious, is, was that mistake a reflection of Malaysian leaders' intention to assimilate and subdue the identity and the status of the two colonial states? Ladies and gentlemen, if, what, if all goes well within the Federation, then this mistake, this, this mistaken historical fact can be easily ignored. 
forgotten. It needed to be corrected without much fanfare. However, if doubt began to emerge by members of the Federation, then a lot of questions needed to be answered. If feelings of being unfairly treated, perceptions of being shortchanged in the allocation of the funds, or ill feeling because the promise had not been kept, then a mere question of mistaken date of Independence Day could escalate into a manner problem. This is because the assessment made by the aggregate parties will venture into dangerous territory, covering hidden agendas. Therefore, sign of dissatisfaction on the Federation must be watched and closely monitored by all relevant authorities. Such, such, such sign of dissatisfaction must not be assumed as mere is merely anger and passing of political gimmick to get attention. Leaders must be able to differentiate between positive criticism and destructive criticism. Positive criticism is done to better the organization, organization in which he or she resides. Destructive criticism is to destroy or topple the organization in which he or she resides. Therefore, never dismiss critic harshly and hastily. For in doing so, but for in doing so, we, we may kill the messenger and miss the message. Malaysians in general are very sensitive to criticism, and hence not very good at learning from mistakes. This trait is very common among members of my profession, i.e. the politician. Once get elected, we assume the position of we know all. You don't question us. Consequently, we do not like to be corrected and very uncomfortable when proven wrong. But yet, we make mistakes over and over again as we try to navigate over gray areas of our political and social terrain. In spite of the numerous challenges that Malaysia has been facing over the last 50 years, the Federation did well. It could, of course, it could be better. As a nation, Malaysia, we must as a, as a nation, Malaysia must evolve and change with time. Never new development means new challenges. New challenges require new mindset and approaches to solve them. As the Federation grows, so are the citizens. They become cleverer and smarter. Therefore, it requires cleverer and smarter leaders to administer them. The multi-ethnic and multi-religious nature of Malaysian society usually creates diverse needs and requirements from its citizens. There will be differences of needs not only among Malaysians, but also the needs of requirement among regions within Malaysia. Take for instance, the needs of Malaya may be different from the needs of the two Borneo states of Sarawak and Sabah. Therefore, the approach of one size fits all will not work and will not work when we don't use it again. In spite of all these challenges in popular politics, economic and society at large, I'm quite confident that Malaysia as federation will survive and grow. So ladies and gentlemen, with a short note before I sit down, I'd like to leave you with one saying which has been said to me many, many times as a politician. It says, all problems can be solved if there are gentlemen sitting around the table to solve them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tan Sri. Um, I'm a bit reminded of what Gladstone said about the schleswig Holstein question, that only three people had ever understood it. One was dead, another went mad, and the third was himself, but he's long since forgotten. But apparently, you know, people do remember, and there's a lot about this in, in, in the book, and history is uh, important. So now we're moving to another generation. Um, Daryl, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I can't help that one. <laughs> Thank you, Kota uh, Kota, in our language, thank you, uh, Professor Andrew Harding, and my elder, uh, someone I've respected for many, many years, and Sir James Massing, uh, Senior Minister from the Sarawak Cabinet. Um, Professor James Harding, uh, eh, Professor James Chin, sorry, I mix the two now. <laughs> That's the nervousness of the politician that they're speaking to academics like you all. Uh, thank you, Professor James, for inviting me. Uh, to give a little bit of thought on uh, the subject and the book that he actually uh, 
gave me only an excerpt, his full chapter, and I've not read the rest. So it would be unfair if uh, I do mention only his. But I'm promoting his book, 40 bucks outside. <laughs> Uh, because he actually speaks what comes from many Sabahans and Sarawakians uh, today. My generation is the 80s generation. We used to have those punk rock hairs and colorful hairs and whatever you want. At that time, when I was growing up, this subject was always spoken of but never really affected me. Uh, I was more interested in you know, the songs of the day and the people of the day and whatever we did at the time. As I grew up and I, as I finished my education, I suddenly had a sense of obligation to do something that many Sabahans, in fact many Sarawakians, have been talking about uh, through the ages and through time and even until now. Um, I believe most of you all have read, have researched and are probably in the know on what are the current feelings of the people in the Borneo states today? I'm sure, right, Mike? Uh, uh, Tansi James Massing mentioned about August 31st being a date that many of us in Sabah are still unhappy about. And I have made a very clear statement of this before I entered politics and even after I entered politics. And as I went to parliament, in my inaugural speech, I made it clear that the 31st of August, celebrated now, is a political creation just to appease a particular uh, movement where the indoctrination, uh, as uh, Professor, J uh, Professor also before, Dr. <laughs> James Massing uh, mentioned, is to make every Malaysian think that the 31st of August is a date for us to, cel to celebrate. I do not agree with that. Uh, I do not agree with what they are doing because we should really talk of Malaysia as being only from the 16th of September, 1963. The agreement mentioned by, by Nancy James, which is the Malaysian Agreement, 1963, and signed on the 9th of July in the United Kingdom, uh, 1963, was in fact amended also uh, just before the 16th of September. I can't quite recall the circa, but it was just before uh, the 16th of September, where the Malaysian agreement was amended to be effective from the 16th of September 1963. Now, without which this amendment would not have been certain. The Malaysian agreement, when it was amended, made it certain for all of us that there was no Malaysia before 16th of September 1963. And that is the basis of our argument today in that particular subject. But I would like to go to a different kind of subject, which is um, currently being spoken about in Sabah today, and also mentioned in this book as I agree is true. There are allegations, in fact, as of last week, made by the Speaker of the House in the State Assembly, Datu Sri Saleh Tansi Sankawa, where he mentioned that the authorities must be must take action and must be aware that there are many movements of secession in Sabah today, uh, even in Sarawak, I think. Now, my opinion of that, and I replied this in the papers last week, uh, was that it's not a fact that it is a secession movement. It is accumulation of anger. It is accumulation of disappointment. People of Sabah, people of Sarawak, in particular, particularly as people of Sabah, uh, they are not happy with the current situation because the younger people are no longer the same younger people before. The younger people of today in Sabah are forced to migrate out of Sabah to work in Peninsula or even to work in Singapore. Now, these two models, Singapore and Peninsula, uh, were part of us in 1963 and Peninsula is still a part of us still today. Now, when these young Sabahans go to Singapore, they see a former partner doing very well. Singapore pays them huge amount of salaries. Singapore gives them a different vision of a country that had no natural resources, and yet they could be where they are today. Now, Peninsula at the same time is the same. When a young Sabahan goes to Peninsula, the first thing he sees is a big airport, 
he has to haggle the prices of the train, uh, sorry, the prices of the taxi or the bus. And when he reaches Kuala Lumpur, he sees a concrete jungle with buildings that he, does, he has not seen in this village. <laughs> Can you imagine this young Sabah going to Peninsula who does not know where he's going to stay, who's not sure whether or not he's going to get a proper paying job, is now in Peninsula, okay, working his behinds out, sorry, <laughs> uh, and looking at himself and saying, hey, I come from, uh, I was told that Sabah is a partner state. Why am I here? And why am I begging for work here? Or why am I, you know, why have I settled down here when I am from a state that formed Malaysia? Now this young Sabahan starts questioning this. This young Sabahan starts comparing what they see in the peninsula. And there is no guidance. Because the guidance that they have is guidance from what they read in the Facebook, what they read, what they hear from their friends, uh, and what they did not know when they were studying in primary schools. What I'm trying to say is this. Our own history books are not saying the right things about the formation of Malaysia. I'm not saying about how we should have been in this promised Federation of Malaysia, but it tells of, of a different history, whereby we go back to what Tan Sin James Masin mentioned. We are supposed to look at one date, 31st of August, even that Sudirman song, Pandal whatever, you know, um, has become some sort of uh, affirmation, at least for the powers that be, that this is the date that we should look at. Now, this poor Sabahat coming here, to the peninsula. He's going to be faced with higher rentals. I think and I believe even a room today costs you four to five hundred a month. Just a simple room. For a West Malaysian that's already heavy, can you imagine the guy who has to fly two and a half hours from the peninsula? With no one and no friends to look at other than friends he makes when he comes along the way here and friends that he interacts when he comes here and, and, and group up. Now, when they come back to Sabah, they're going to talk about what they saw here. And that, believe me, my friends, is going to be built into a movement that is angry. It's a movement that is not happy. This is not what they were told Sabah should be. This is not the Sabah they dreamt of. Especially when they go to Singapore. Uh, in Peninsula, you have yet to see an underground uh, station, but definitely in Singapore, you see underground everywhere. Now, when they are kidding that to Sabah, the underground that you see in Sabah, um, of course, we have gas and oil somewhere in our offshore and onshore. So that's the only ground, underground that they speak of today. So this movement that is alleged to be a secessionist movement in Sabah, at least, is not a secessionist movement. I have always taken the position that Sabah should not talk of secession, but Sabah should talk of reaffirmation of our position when we form Malaysia. The Federation was made out of a dream, a dream to balance um, the, the particular races at the time. Of course, we should not be talking of race even at the time, but it was a fact at the time. Uh, they were the convincing argument that uh, President Lee Kuan Yew had Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew had, sorry, at the time was if the North, uh, sorry, North Sabah and Sarawak were to be together in the formation of Malaysia, they will equate the balance of the Malays in Peninsula at the time, Tanah Melayu. And this was agreed upon so that everybody had this equal chance or equal administration of the state of the nation run by people with uh, proper balance in representation. The ideas of Sabahans at the time, or North Borneo at the time, was to be out of the British rule because they already felt they were uh, underclass, the, the second class North Borneo people when the British were ruling uh, Sabah or North Borneo at the time. So they joined up with people who had the same feeling, the Sarawakians.